Hello, everybody. How you doing? All right. Oops, choose the wrong one. I'm going to keep my hands off the controls. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? I'm very well. How are you? Good. Uh, so we're switched now. So last week I could look this way and look like I was looking at you now. It looks like I'm uh, looking the other way. So hi, everyone. How you doing? Uh, we are about to talk about compression. Uh, this is Timescale Tuesday. And so I'll share my screen here in just a minute. And the goal of Timescale Tuesday is to, um, you know, really uh, try and get you know, some try and get some things really uh, questions that users are having about time scale, uh, you know, just bring them more and more to the front so we can try and get a better understanding of how to um, you know, better address them and use them, uh, you, you know, create tutorials, create help information and just help you understand the feature set. And so last week we talked about um, continuous aggregates a little bit. We kind of always say we could talk about continuous aggregates all day, every day. Um, and still, I think that we would, um, you know, we'd have questions, right? Yeah, absolutely. Com continuous aggregates, uh, compression, um, yeah. maybe data retention as well, but definitely continuous aggregates and compression. I think uh, the number, uh, uh, well, number one and number two topics we see uh, questions uh, about sure. in the community Slack. Yeah. Uh, are you sharing oh, your uh, screen right now? Oh, no, I to... need to share my screen now, don't I? How about I do oh, that? Yep. Perfect. Work. So uh, today we'll talk about compression. And the goal this is going to be two-parter. Uh, this hopefully will not be an hour, uh, maybe 30, 35, 40 minutes. Uh, what I want to do is walk you through. I always say that, and then we go at least an hour because we get talking. So we'll see what happens. But the goal is this. I've actually done a lot of this before, but I, I got sidetracked because of a, a presentation that was going on. Um, so the goal is to just quickly show you, I'm not going to go through all of the features of compression. I just want to make sure that we have some uh, example content about how to actually set up compression and a couple of the things that you have to understand about compressed hyper tables uh, as you head into it. And these are the things that most people uh, you know, get confused about. And the one thing I'm, I'm hoping to show you is uh, it's been running. I, I've been trying for the last hour to get a new demo database running. Um, and of course, it looks like it has uh, failed. So we'll see what happens. I may or may not get this done. Uh, we'll see what's in there. Um, I can do most of it. What I was hoping to show you is um, how to, I'm going to bring this back to the floor here, how to uh, you know, think about the settings of the chunk size and some other things and, and how that impacts both the ability to compress the data and um, you know, the, the ability of queries to act in some cases faster on compressed data and what that looks like. So uh, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move through this a little bit. If you have questions, please pop in Attila. My name is Ryan Booz. Attila Toth, uh, we are both developer advocates with TimescaleDB. And you know, we say this often, you see us online, you see some of our blog posts. Hopefully you're starting to interact with these as well, uh, these live streams. If you have questions and you're watching, please don't hesitate to ask. We can see that chat both on YouTube and Twitch. And we would love to, you know, if we need to talk about something specific as we're demoing, please let us know. So here is uh, TimescaleDB native compression. It was introduced in TimescaleDB 1.5. Uh, it, it didn't change much until Timescale 2.1. So uh, it was, the data could be compressed. It was turned into column store data, but it was immutable. So the chunks that were then compressed could not be modified, inserted, updated, schema, until those chunks were decompressed. And then globally on the table, because some of the chunks were compressed and some might not be compressed, you couldn't change the schema of the overall table either. So in version 2.1, we added the ability to uh, add and rename columns. Uh, to a compressed hyper table. So this was lowered the bar in one sense. So now people uh, who maybe weren't using compressed data or compressed hyper tables because of that limitation could compress their data knowing that in the future, if they had to add a column or rename a column, they could do that. And we would go through the compressed chunks and, and do appropriately what we needed to for those columns. And then in version 2.3, we did have the ability to insert rows, insert only, into compressed chunks. This was another area that people were like, well, I still can't use this because if I have to insert older data, 
up until then, you would get an error. If you said insert into hypertable values X, and the time range of those values corresponded to a compressed chunk in the hypertable, you would get an error that said, you know, you cannot modify a compressed chunk essentially. And so we lifted that limitation. We continue to work towards even more. You know, the, the ultimate goal is to take something that never existed in Postgres, right? The ability to do column store uh, data, you know, basically taking your data and turning it into column store, which allows good compression, uh, querying abilities around arrays of items, things like that, uh, to allow them to be mutable. Uh, and so we're making small steps as we go. And uh, as I know, <clears throat> with compressed compressed uh, data, uh, it uh, they make uh, sort of uh, deep but uh, uh, narrow queries uh, more efficient. Uh, so yeah, just to add. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So this is what we're all used to. We call this a logical data definition, right? This is logically what is stored in the database uh, for a table like this. So. Is an example table. It has four columns, a timestamp, at least two devices, device A, device B, and some readings. And so, you know, imagine this table had 10 columns, uh, something of that nature. So often in time series data, you need the most recent information more frequently. And you want various pieces of it, not just one column. You want to know, you know, in this case, let's say these are IoT devices. And every hour, we are looking for the top temperature, you know, uh, we're grouping by every device, we're looking for how much bandwidth it had, we're looking for error. So multiple columns or all of the columns um, for every device, uh, you would, this would be beneficial because to get all of those columns individually means we both have to, uh, you know, we have to go do requests for every column and we have to decompress it and so forth. And so logically, this is what you get, and this is what every relational database generally does, um, unless it's a, a specialized database. And so, you know, this is good for near-term stuff, but when you need to start to query lots and lots of data, the problem is when I ask for, so in a row store database, which is what Postgres is by default, if I just want these two columns based on some time range, I still get the entire row of data has to be read into memory. So the entire row has to be read over and over and over again. That's okay for near-term stuff, but when I need to query weeks or months of data, I'm querying lots and lots of extra data that I'm probably not doing. I might do, you know, select average of device A over some time range for temperature, average, average temperature. Well, if I just need that one column, I can be a lot more efficient by just getting information for device A for that one column for a range. And then usually I can actually, uh, it can it can uh, speed up the query as well. Well, you can't so, do that in most, go for it, yeah. Sorry, just a question. Uh, so even in regular Postgres, if you just select, uh, you know, specific columns, still the whole row will get loaded into memory. Yeah, so that's a great question because there's a nuance there, right? Um, uh, so if you have an index, on the keys that you're querying by in the column. There's always the chance that Postgres and other databases do this as well, can just read the information you need from that index, which then would not have all of the other columns. Uh, there's, there's a lot of nuance there, but in general, if I had an index, let's say this table was 10 columns wide and I just wanted the temperature. If I was indexing time, device, and temperature, um, then, you know, if I had an index on that, there's, there's a good chance it would use it. It would still, you know, read it in a, in a row fashion. Mm -hmm. The difference there is, so that's, that's one good nuance, right? You can certainly make queries faster by having the proper indexes based on what you're doing. The difference though, is, uh, you have some limitation in ordering, right? I mean, you have to specify the order in the, in the, um, in the index and, uh, by default, there's there's no compression, right? There's uh, aside from what the database might give some generalized compression of that data. Um, there's no specific compression given on the index, which can be a benefit as well. Yeah, it's a good call. That is why select star, uh, particularly if you have 
you know, indexes that meet specific qualifications, select star is not a great option, right? If I can, if I only need a couple columns and I have an index specified or based on some portion of those columns, usually you benefit in the end. So good question. So row store characteristics are, we've said all this, right? So it's indexable. You can pick any column as long as that data type can have an index created. And Postgres has lots of cool indexes, right? It's not just B-tree. You can do bin, uh, bin indexes and so forth. Um, so it's indexable. So you can actually create a multi-column index with included columns and really get one query working pretty fast uh, in a lot of circumstances. High concurrency, right? So as long as you're doing lots of small reads, like inserts, or you know, to see most recent data that's a, across a narrow time range, um, a shallow time range, I should say, it's pretty fast uh, because a lot of that data can be stored in memory, and you can just iterate it over and over again. Um, the problem here is it's often I/O bound with aggregates, right? Because we have to get all of those that data out generally, or more data than we need, and so you're reading lots of pages of information off of the disk then to get the correct information off the page and then to aggregate it. So as you try and query more, you're usually bound by IO in some way. Um, and as we said, there's a per row overhead because everything is a transaction, especially as you're inserting and so forth. Um, and it compresses badly. So Postgres does have the ability to compress tables. Uh, and by default, it uses ZFS, although with newer versions, uh, they've now included LZ4 as an option. And so it does compress it, but it's just a blanket compression for the data table itself, right? For the pages on disk. Uh, and it's happening at the disk level. Nothing's been done to the data that might make it more valuable and more readable when you read it off disk. Now, if you look at that from a column store perspective, we can take those exact same rows. This is the same data as on the previous screen. But now if you think about it, notice my little brackets here. Right? And we have essentially the same thing in our documentation. So you can look at that. If you look at the brackets as being a row of data, you notice there's no, there's no horizontal dividers here, right? So every row is not divided. This is in essentially one big row of data. And what we do in time scale is we uh, basically create, uh, we, we create buckets of these things and we now go store them off the row. And so what actually is stored in the database is a pointer to that chunk of rows, all right? And so this means that it's really efficient. So to query one row, you know, I say, hey, give me all information for you know, device A across this timestamp. Well, all of that information might be stored in one row of a compressed press table. So you've read one row, it says, hey, you want the temperature? Go over, you know, you want that column of data? Go over here to this toast table. So it's 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 the toast mechanism in Postgres. And you'll find that array of data there. So now you've done one row query in theory and one fetch off a of toast. So it's a very fast operation, particularly when this stuff is not in memory. So if this is an older set of data that's not queried often, it's a way more efficient uh, operation to get this data out and to query it. So that's essentially what we do uh, with compression. Now, there's other nuances there, and we'll talk about a few of them. Am I missing anything that's coming to mind? Or is that a clear enough explanation of what we did? Uh, I think it's clear enough. I think one thing uh, you might mention later, uh, but yeah. might be pointed here as well. So you um, <clears throat> so that or, or showed, showed that Postgres also can do uh, compression, and but it much much less uh, uh, effective. I think it uh, can do like seven to nine percent uh, compression rate or something like that. Now compared to that, uh, what uh, uh, what what can TimescaleDB DB do? Like what kind of uh, you know, compression, com well, compression rate. Yeah, we're gonna we're actually gonna look at that. Um, we often see in real time workloads. We've had a few uh, users on recently to like our community day. So real time IoT data, actual real life stuff going on right now. We regularly see uh, above ninety percent um, on compression. And so that's huge, right? You you take a gigabyte set of data and you compress it to you know hundred megs. Uh, that's pretty amazing. Uh, to, to see happen. 
So we're going to, there are some factors there. And so we're going to talk about that today. Hopefully, hopefully we're going to show that today. So, cool. Yeah. Um, so this is what we said. We can scan columns individually. So this is really great when you need to, so the, the, I don't have all of the things in here. I didn't want to get into lots and lots of uh, like super details here. Next week, I'm going to bring on uh, another uh, uh, David Cohn, who's written a lot of our recent timescale toolkit uh, blog posts and, and hyperfunction blog posts. Uh, he and I are going to dig a little bit deeper, mostly about, you know, now that you have compression, how can you understand, you know, maybe ways to improve compression, right? Hey, you're not seeing 90%. What are some ways you could think about modifying the data or your setup to do that? Um, you know, what kind of queries will benefit more from compression as you go back in time, things like that. So we're not going to get into all of those, but the basics are when you get to this, when we take those rows of data, compress them into individual rows, we do this on up to 1000 rows at a time. So if I have, you know, in theory, if I have a hyper table that has a hundred thousand rows and the compression settings work correct, you know, are perfect in some way that all of the stuff lines up, I could go from 100,000 rows to 100 rows. And what we would say is, hey, when I query for device A in this time range, Timescale still knows which chunks to go look in. And then it says, oh, one of these is a compressed chunk. So now I'm going to find just the rows. You went from 100,000 rows to 100. I'm going to find the rows out of the 100 that reference the device you're asking for in this time range. And then I can just go get the values off disk for that column for that device. So it, it really starts to change how we do this. So this is a very limited example of a few rows. But in one row of a compressed hyper table, you can have groups of up to 1,000 values per column. All right. So if all the stars align, now you don't get a thousand X compression, you know, what you get based on data types and those kinds of things, you get a significantly reduced number of rows we have to go search for before we go get the values off a of disk. So that's where a lot of the savings really come in. It's highly compressible. It's really efficient for aggregates because now we're giving you an array of values for aggregates. And a lot of those aggregations can work much faster on a, you know, a whole set of values right there rather than having to come up with it on its own. Um, however, and this is true of any column store database anywhere, it is expensive to reconstruct the whole row. So I see this often. Uh, you know, why can't I, you know, I compress my hyper table and now I do select star and it's way slower. I thought this was going to make things faster. Well, the reason is you said select star, which we just talked about, you know, a couple of minutes ago. When you say select star, it's got, it has to go get all of the columns to give it all back to you. If your specific application always needs all of the columns and never any other way, probably you're going to save space, but the queries will likely be a little bit slower, quite honestly, um, because it has to do all that, has to get the data, has to decompress it, and it has to reform a full row. Um, but if you have aggregate queries and, and um, you know, report like queries, a lot of ways this can help. Um, per row updates and deletes are expensive if possible at all, right? So if this is why we still have this limitation. Knowing, I'll go back one more time, knowing that the data gets transformed into this, if I want to update this one value, I now have to go, I have to know which value in the array Again, I'm using array lightly, but which value in this group of data needs to be modified based on a timestamp, based on the column. So there's a lot of nuance in actually getting into that array and changing that value, right? So now we have to figure out how to decompress and make sure we have the right thing and, and so forth. So it's usually really hard to do. Uh, and one of the reasons a lot of other column store databases actually have things like, um, you know, append only. If you, you know, if you need to redo something, you you have to delete it all and, and re-import it, things of that nature. We're working towards making it easier uh, to something we're doing. Limited on right now. Uh, and then indexing is coarse grain. So hopefully this also makes sense. Um, if I go back, man, this is fun. Just keeping flipping back and forth here. 
we went from rows of data with types, right? Here's a timestamp column. Well, I'll go back up here. That'll make it easier. Whoops. Right, this is our row data. It has individual columns with individual types. This is a timestamp. This is, I don't know, let's say this is a text field. This is a float value. In a B tree nature or some other kinds of indexes, we can create leafed B tree indexes and Brin ranges and so forth that help us quickly and efficiently find the page on disk that that row is on to get it back. However, when I take all of these types and now just make them compressed uh, ranges of values, it's not a timestamp anymore. It's an array like thing that happens to contain timestamps that are then compressed, right? So it's not an actual textual timestamp value. It's, it's a compressed representation of the timestamp. And so if I had an index on device and I leave it like this, I no longer can have that same B-tree index because it's, it's not referring to a row. It's referring to a group of data now. And so uh, it's very coarse grained. And we're going to talk about what that looks like with Timescale TV. Can you, you can you add uh, continuous? Can you create a continuous aggregate on top of a compressed table? Wow, that's a great question. I should add that to the slides. You can, right? So we can still create a continuous aggregate. We can query, um, we can query the compressed hyper table just like a regular hyper table. What you're going to see, I hope, is that the speed or the way that it gets queried. Timescale DB takes care of, but uh, it, again, it might be faster, it might be slower. It's just going to be a little bit different when it touches chunks that are compressed, right? So the difference here is currently you can uh, insert data into compressed chunks. So if that compressed chunk is in a refresh window for a continuous aggregate, it will get it, you'll get the new value, everyone's happy. Now you can't delete and you can't update values in compressed chunk yet. And so, you know, that wouldn't impact the continuous aggregate at all. Uh, you can do data retention on a compressed chunk, right? It still has a range of time. And so you can still drop that chunk to save even more space over time and so forth. So in most ways, it's pretty transparent to you as a user, but the value and the, the speed at which it works and how compressed the data becomes does require some nuance, which is what I want to talk about today. And so, uh, one, one more quick question, yeah. uh, if I can. Uh, I love your can, questions. These are great questions. Can you st uh, still, uh, like, for example, join uh, a compress table with some other table? Like, can you still use the these SQL like uh, things that you might want to do? You absolutely can, and you'll fall under the same nuances there, right? So, joins are most efficient when there's an index to help do the join. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I'm, if I have a, uh, so let's, let's go back to the device table. If uh, you're gonna see this in a little bit, so I can actually create what's called a segment by column and we're gonna show why that's valuable on uh, something like device ID. So if I segment by device ID, then what happens is all of my device ID rows get stored together. So now if I join to the compressed chunk on device ID, that is actually still a regular Postgres uh, typed table that I can create an index on, and that join will still be fast. Now, if I have something else like status code, and that is compressed, in order to, whoa, where'd I go? In order to um, actually find and join maybe on a status code of four, in this case, last one, I would have to actually decompress all of the rows in that time range to find them. And so it could be slower because I can't index the things that I that I need to. So you can absolutely do it. You might end up with a slower query depending on exactly what you're trying to do. Mm, makes sense. And so there are ways around that. Uh, yep, yeah, I mean, the ways around it are you could... Um, the way you order your data matters. Um, so you can actually order the, the stuff in the array so that you know if you know you're always going to query by the highest status code or something like that, it will have to decompress fewer rows because it, it knows when it, it gets to the end of that status code, that kind of thing. 
What were you saying? Um, I don't know. I forgot. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm going to quickly see if I can. I'm uh, going to quickly try and see if I can fix this. I do want to see. Uh, I'm over here. So here's what I'm doing. I'm actually, what I was trying to do is insert uh, a new set of data uh, for here. No, that's not it. All right, so I'm not sure if I, if we get to that point, I'll, I'll see if I can get it fixed. Um, it almost seems like it's not choosing the right port. Hmm. All right. Let's see if that happens or not. I'm not going to do. All right, so here, let's talk about compression. Um, in a couple ways that we can look at this. So uh, what I did is, here's my main goal. I want to show you both how to set it up and then just a few things to consider uh, that will impact both the compression rate that you're getting and then hopefully I can show you an example of uh, a query that is made faster by compressing a hypertable, at least in history. So uh, I have a couple other demos around uh, about creating sample data. So this is uh, what I had used as part of that, that sample. So let me just show you what this is. This is totally made up information. It is a table that has, in fact, I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, it has a number of different columns. It has a timestamp. It has an integer, some double precisions, and so forth. Totally made up. Uh, and then I created some uh functions that allowed me to get somewhat more realistic data um meaning you know rather than just a random value that has 13 decimal points um you know instead for the temperature you know maybe it has two decimal points or one decimal point so more of what you would expect to see in real life uh and then we'll we'll talk about what it looks like if you uh, if you have something else uh you know bigger numbers and then I create one other function which uh, uses time scale views. Uh, it is this view here um, from compression stats. So I can name a table and I can get the compression stats of a specific uh, table chunk by chunk. And so it's just some functions I, I created. Uh, and then I inserted data into this table. So I actually did all this ahead of time to save some time. Uh, this ends up being let's see what this ends up being uh so this is for all right so log all right so 750,000 rows uh it's not the biggest table by any stretch uh, it is for 2 months of time and what i didn't say earlier and i should have is when i created this table I just said create hypertable. And so by default, that creates a chunk time, the partitions that we store your data in over time, a seven day interval. So that means that every seven days of data time, so the timestamps on your data that you're partitioning by, in this case, it's that time column. Every time I have you know greater than seven days, we're going to create a new chunk to start storing the new set of data as it comes in. Uh, the great thing about hypertables is they don't care if the data is actually newer or, or, or older. There's some other databases that do, are starting to do similar things, but you still have to actually, uh, and you can try and do this on your own with, with other features in Postgres, but you have to always, the partitions have to exist before the data can be stored. And so if you don't use timescale, you actually have to create your own functions and, uh, or you have to pre-set up the data Hey, I'm about to insert data. Do I have partitions for it? Oh, I don't. Now I have to create those partitions to do all that work. Timescale takes care of that for you. So if I were just to insert data for a year ago, all of a sudden, timescale will create the chunks so they don't exist. And it will create those chunks in seven days in this case and make that happen. So the chunk time is going to be important, and we'll see why in a minute. So I inserted 750,000 rows of data, five-minute intervals for 200 fake trucks, over a period of time. 
And so uh, I did create some indexes to show you why in just a minute. So I created one on truck ID and on ID and time. So here's what this looks like. For truck log, I end up having 63 chunks. So uh, seven days of, well, I must have inserted more than seven days of data at this point if I do that math correctly. Um, I probably did more of this over time. Um, so we, that means that uh, if I, I'm kind of stuttering here, I can see by the examples, I did play with this earlier and I must've been served more data and not realized it. So this is gonna be fun. Um, I, that just means that I, I get all of the information, uh, you know, each one of these chunks represents seven days. If I then look at one of those hyper tables, so, um, I'm, oh, that's what I did. I redid this one later, I think is what happened here. So here we go, let's do this. So now I can actually go look at one of those chunks and I can say approximately how many rows per truck ID do I have, all right? And so in this case, now this is probably the one of the more recent ones. So let me actually grab a different one. So you can kind of get a sense. Let me grab something random down here. Uh, you can get a sense for how uh, densely populated, there you go, so 288 chunks per uh, truck, how densely populated a chunk is. And this is good or bad, but what we learned earlier is that when I compress a table, it will take up to 1,000 rows per, per segment, whatever that segment is, and so we can already see that we only have about a fifth of the potential data possible per, per item. So if I were to compress by, um, by truck, I'm going to get one row per truck, but it only has 288 values in that row. I could have up to 1,000. So already I would say this table probably is a little bit underutilized. Um, and so I'm realizing two things as I'm going through this demo. Uh, I had been selecting some of the stuff, but it, I'm going to do something real quick. I'm going to go ahead and truncate this. Truncate, um, truncate. The truncate will actually remove all the data efficiently. It actually gets rid of the chunks so I can start over again. Um, I'm going to go ahead and insert this data again so I'm, I'm sure that I have. So this is the last two months. Uh, this takes just a few seconds on this instance, I think maybe 10, something like that. I say that it's been a while since I've done this. Um, if you look at the sample data series, there are 200 things, five minute intervals for two months. Uh, this is probably a lot more data than I think it is. This must be a couple million. Um, I have a question. Yeah, um, go for it. You mentioned the, num the maximum number of rows uh, uh, to be to be compressed. I guess can be a, a thousand, Correct. and pair in our case uh, truck ID. So if we have more than a thousand for each truck ID, will that create multiple uh, compressed chunks? And one will be sort of fully utilized. The other one will be less utilized so this yeah way. great man you're like you should be on every you, you ask great questions <laughs> um no so there you go we create multiple rows for the segment by but we get uh up to a thousand items so i obviously had been mucking with that over the last day preparing for this instead we now have 3.5 million rows if i were to uh show you now let's look at those chunks i'll go ahead and create one let me select out of one that's kind of in the middle. That way I'm sure it's not at the beginning or the end, which might not be utilized. Now we see that we are back to our 288, but I actually have uh, 200 rows here because I have 200 devices. So something was up with the other one, my apologies. So when I compress this at seven day intervals, um, I don't have that many readings per truck. Like this isn't actually doing nearly what I was hoping it would do. Uh, if I had 2,000 readings per truck, I would get two rows. So for instance, for truck ID 8, I would get two to three rows. It depends on the timestamps and the ranges. But 
I would expect, let's say I had 2000 values per truck. I would expect to get two rows in the compressed chunk. And so it's always a one-to-one, -one, uh, it's always one-to-one, -one, one regular chunk to one compressed chunk. So I take a regular chunk and I now compress it. I still only ever get one chunk. We don't split chunks up uh, beyond that. Great question. And so now if I query this, so I'm going to query the average weight of the truck over the last week, uh, two weeks, and I'm picking a specific truck ID. Uh, let me make sure that, yeah, I have those. Uh, pretty fast. Uh, one way to measure the amount of data that was needed to get that information is uh, the number of pages hit. And so it, it had to read 7,000 pages of data, uh, almost 8,000 pages, which is eight kilobytes bytes per page. Uh, so this is many megabytes of data it had to get because it still had to go get all of that other, all of the other columns off of disk. And so now if I uh, go ahead and alter this, I'm going to enable compression. And so what I'm going to do is um, segment it by times. So this is a couple things you can decide. What we say is if you are always going to query your compressed chunks based on some value, like an identifier, it's probably a good idea to segment by that identifier. If you don't segment by anything, then we basically order the call the, the table by default. We order it by time or your time stamp of the comp of the hyper table. And we just go a thousand rows at a time. Or if you or you can order it by multiple columns, but we're not specifically saying we're going to both order it by something and segment it by some identifier. There are advantages and disadvantages here. The disadvantage of not using segment by is you will lose out on that ability for the query planner to go right to rows in the compressed chunk that match that ID. Instead, what we, it would have to do then is basically decompress each row in that compressed chunk to, uh, to find information, excuse me, about that ID. Um, the, the advantage, or maybe one reason you wouldn't do segment by, is if the values are consistently incrementing or decrementing, right, or decreasing because we do specific compression rates on each uh, type of data. So on integers or floats and so forth, we do like a delta delta. And so if your values are pretty smooth going one way or the other um, across many devices, you might get a little bit better compression, actual ratio by not segmenting. So there's just so many things to consider, but for the most part, I would say that the majority of users are going to create a segment by in some way. So we're going to go ahead and um, segment by truck ID. And uh, we're going to go ahead and compress chunks that are older than one week. Um, so that is, again, I have one week chunks. So I'm going to compress them. And if they're, you know, if they're not compressed. And uh, how many chunks do we have? I forget. Uh, yeah, show chunks. Okay, so we do have 62 chunks. And I'm not 100% sure how this shouldn't take too, too, too long, but let's see what happens. This might take longer than I think. So you're manually compressing go. it right now. Yeah, so I mean, I'm not setting up any compression policy. Uh, we'll probably talk about that next week, quite honestly. But I'm manually saying, go get me the chunks that are older than one week from this table pass them into me so that I can compress them using the function compress chunk. And now we'll see that the compression, um, the compression stats are this. So before compression for the chunks that I compressed, uh, they were, uh, you know, 268 megabytes and now it's 92. So a compression ratio of 2.9, which isn't great, quite honestly. Um, it's about 65% different. And so we're going to talk about hopefully a couple of ways that, that can be improved. Um, the couple other things to show you then. So the one thing you might notice is I did create an index on truck ID. Oops, sorry, that didn't work. I have an index on truck ID and on time. 
And what you'll see is now if I go look at um, the, okay, so now I'm going to go look at the hyper table. And we can see in here, eventually, I have this public truck log table reference. Way over here, we have a reference to hypertable 54. And so that means that hypertable 54 is actually the compressed side of this hypertable. So that's how you can find the hypertable that is compressed. And uh, so now I'm going to say 54 instead. And you'll see that we have um, total rows in this chunk is now 10,000. So uh, if I were to find an earlier chunk, I had that up here. Let's just do this by. So it was 57,000 rows. So that same chunk uh, now got brought down to, um, sorry, I'm lying. I'm, no, I'm not, I'm not even paying attention. This is one chunk. Uh, sorry, the actual hyper table. That was silly of me. Uh, so the actual hyper table is truck log. Right. It has 3.5 million rows. And if I go look at the compressed side, so this is all of the chunks that are compressed. Right. So I'm looking at the high level compressed table. I, I'm down to 10,000 rows. So we, we have shrunk a lot. You know, we had 288 rows per device, per chunk, da, 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 da. So we get a lot. The difference here is that if I look at um, the, the indexes, so you can see I have that index uh, on truck log, which is on time. Um, but if I now go look at, let me see if I can find... And do this. Let's see if that finds me anything here. And you'll see that we don't get um, uh, this is not actually uh, an index. it's it's a it's an index that time index is gone. Uh, we've created an index on truck ID instead with uh, some meta information on top of the index for ranges of time. So that's probably the, you know, we talked about that in the slides. We go, went from row store to these individual columns of data and because those columns are no longer the actual values, they're compressed representation of the values. I can't index them. So we remove the indexes. If you decompress a chunk, we restore the indexes on that chunk, right? So it's this give and take as we keep doing those things. So now what we're going to do is uh, I created this uh, one day hyper table. So let's uh, go ahead and see what's in this. So you'll see that I have um, 62. I think what I'm gonna do here is, I was playing with this last night and I feel like I've gotten this into a weird state here. So here's what we're gonna do. Um, yes, uh, let me go ahead and truncate. I'm just gonna drop table. that. I'm going to recreate this. I'm basically saying create a table that's just like the other one, no data. Um, and then I'm going to create it as a hyper table with a one day interval. Now I'm going to go ahead and insert from truck log into this table. So I'm, I'm copying all that same data in all 3.15 or 3.5 million rows. But now I've reduced the chunk size um, to one day rather than seven days. Now, the problem here is if you, I don't know, do you know what's going to happen here, Tilla? Um, well, you will have a lot more chunks. That's for sure. I should have a lot more chunks. Um, and uh, the, the count, so I'm going to take one of these. And then you will have like, I don't know, maybe 40 records in a chunk. So here's the deal. I'm just realizing this. I, at some point, must have changed that truck log thing. That, that's, this is not going like I was hoping. Say, so, hey, let's do this instead. Let's drop this. 
let's uh, really go down to six hours and know that I have six hours. So at some point, I stupidly was playing with this last night, and I must have updated that chunk, and that was my fault. We'll go to six hours so you can really see the difference. So at one day, we had um, 288 values per chunk. And now you should see, yes, that we have, uh, you know, four times less, right? So 24 hours, oops, select one. So if I take a, uh, let me take a different chunk. And I'm always taking a chunk somewhere in the middle because again, if it's the first chunk or the most recent chunk, it might not be full. So now we're down to 72 rows per device, per, per thing we're measuring. So if I compress this, which I will go ahead and do, and number one, I have more chunks. Uh, so I, what, what's this here? I now have over 200. The beaver stops at 200 by default unless I do a, a count. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and set up a compression. I'm going to compress everything older than 12 hours. So it's going to be the, the last chunk or two. And what you'll see is we had a 2.9x compression ratio. I would expect this to have a, a lower compression ratio, which it does. Right? We've taken um, uh, more. We've taken the same amount of data, but we were not able to stuff as many things into one. And so, really, the the overall uh, full first point of this is that um, oh, I just got a message. I wonder if someone's trying to message me about the stream. Um, is that you know the larger the 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 table, the larger the chunk size, within reason, you're going to get better compression. So here's what I'll, I'll do real quick just to show that. So that's one of the first things I would say. If you are going to, you know, if you're trying to get compression and you haven't looked at your data, uh, I'll just do this as quickly as I can. Week. So let me just create that one week table. So let me actually do one week and make sure that I really have it as an example. Uh, I think I have to do seven days. I can't remember. Not six weeks, although we could try that. Right, so we'll do one week. Insert that. So now with one week, two months, I should have like eight to 10 chunks, I would assume. All right, same three point, some values. We now have, oops, one week. We now have nine chunks, that makes sense. If I take one of those chunks, now let's see what we got. Now we're up to 2000 uh, values per device in one chunk of data. So I'm gonna go from 2000 rows per device, in theory, to about three rows. It's a little over 2,000, so I can do up to 1,000 values per. Depends on ranges, so we might end up with four rows. We might end up with five. It just depends, but we're going to shrink this significantly. So let's go ahead and do that. And we're going to say one week. And we're going to say older than one so now we're going to compress, in theory, eight-ish, seven or eight of the chunks. We got seven chunks compressed. And now if I look at the compression ratio of that, you can see we're up a little bit. So now we're up to three, right? So now the question is, I mean, you just went from 200 rows to 2,000 rows. Why didn't it increase a lot more? Well, there's a lot of reasons that could be. Uh, it could be the way of, I've ordered it. could be the way I've segmented it. Um, and so this gets me to kind of the, the next point of what I was going to show, which is the value of time. So in this case, um, you know, I had mostly just integers, right? So I had a timestamp, I had some integers, but this is random data. And so all of these are created based on, um, you know, delta deltas, right? So one value, the change in one value to the next ordered by the things you're segmenting by and so forth. Most devices that you're measuring, most things that happen, stock market, IoT, 
don't jump around from second to second, you know, from a really big value to a really low value in that case. Um, and so one of the reasons in this uh, example, I don't get great compression is because I, I don't get, you know, the values are kind of jumping all over the place. To demonstrate that, if I just select uh, star from truck, I'll do, sure, I'll do the six hour one for, uh, I'll just limit 200. And device. Oh, not device ID, truck ID. Oops, limit goes last, folks. That's how this works. You see that the values really, you know, even though they're within a range, um, they kind of go up and down around. The weight goes all over the place. Uh, distance, you know, just has no real consistency. And this is device to device. If I were to switch this uh, and do truck ID, because this is how it is actually in the data, See that like these things just jump all over the place, and so we got to store those deltas. These jump all over the place, uh, you know, on a row by row basis. Um, and so you'll see that a lot of information that goes uh, compresses uh, higher. It will have order to them. They'll they'll have ways. And this is why I was saying earlier, if you segment by if you don't segment by something, there is an argument sometimes for just ordering by. So we just take a thousand rows in some specific order. And if you know that that order is always going to be, you know, have some fluidity to it, you might end up with, with better compression and so forth. How, um, yeah, go for it. How does order by like, you, like currently you have time, um, set for order by, but like, could you expand on that? Like what, what, sure. Like, one in in what scenario you would put like i don't know something else other than time in order by yeah so let me just show you one thing first um let's see if this will let's just see if this will do what i want Um, so the order by, by default, if you don't tell time scale anything else, uh, okay, so that's the hypertonic. So let me go find, uh, and I probably have this over here. Let me see if I have this over here because I wanted to demo this. All right, so what I can do is... Uh, so it's not that one. There we go. So if I select directly from the compressed hyper table, in this case, I'll do see if 53 works for me, 59. Yeah, that's not what I meant. So let me... Let me take another one there. What was it, 53? Let me just see if that even has what I want. Nope. Uh, this always gets slightly annoying for me. Uh, if I look at hyper tables, go here, hyper tables. Uh, okay, so it's actually in the catalog. Oh, this is this is exactly why we do live coding. There we go. All right, so I have this is the table I want to look at. So if I query from compressed hypertable sixty, that's the compressed hypertable for uh, the one week I just did. Now you see what is actually stored in the compressed chunk for that hyper table. So truck ID, these are, it's compressed, right? So there's a compression algorithm over top of this. So you don't see the timestamps, you don't see the array. Instead, you can see that we have 
multiple rows per, per segment by. And the order by would then mean, and here's the value of order by. Um, and we talk about this in the documentation. If you order something by timestamp, that's really valuable because we, uh, you know, we can, um, when you say, get me everything for truck X, you know, order by time ascending, we, we can just basically start to decompress each row and just scan out the row really quickly. But it's also valuable if you, um, you know, you always do something like select, select value uh, from this compressed chunk for truck ID X, where value, let's say we're temperature, uh, is that one of the first columns here? Lat long. Uh, I think I've where temperature is greater than you know ten, and so if I've ordered it by time and temperature, it then it basically starts decompressing the row, scanning it out, and it knows at some point it's going to get to the end of um, value ten, right? And so now it's it's it eventually gets to nine. It's like I'm ordered, I'm done and it can stop streaming the rows out of that chunk. Now, if you order by lots of things, you eventually, you know, nothing gets ordered, right? I can't order by 15 columns and have it all work out. Um, it's, or, you know, truck ID ordered by time is, is really typical. Maybe it's by time and, uh, or maybe it's, you know, by temperature. Maybe time is not the most important thing to you. We know the we still group stuff by time, but we know within that range, that chunk, uh, we're getting values in a specific, specific order. And so the, so basically compression works in a similar way as continuous aggregates regarding how it stores the, uh, you know, data itself. Like it doesn't store the actual values. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great question. Uh, yeah. That is true. So every column you'll notice that the look of the of the data is um, you know is different because the algorithms being used. Now you know anytime you do some kind of compression, uh, the lat and the long are both double precision. You'll see that the the headers on them are very similar, right? Um, I'm not going to go into. It. We have an article on on the different data types that we use. Uh, whereas you know the date is stored one way. Uh, the integers or the du the double precisions are stored, a, you know, maybe a different way when it comes to uh, how we do the delta delta comparison of it and so forth. There's a little bit in here on both the type that's being stored and the way it's being compressed, right? So integer versus double precision. Um, but yeah, it's actually a compression algorithm. So you know, when you want to get the values out of this chunk of time for that device, whatever that is, we take this, run it through decompression. And actually show you the value. And to do that, you know, we can run a query. Uh, do I thought I had one over here? I'm going to do. A, I guess I had one at the very top, didn't I? So now let's look at that average again. So I don't know if, if you remember. Uh, I barely remember. So this is our truck log, and I redid this, um, although it was set. So we're going to do truck log of one week. So we're going to query from this uh, for that specific truck. So previously, uncompressed, we had to get seven, almost 8,000 pages of data. But now I'm saying, go get me the one column for this time range. And you'll see that um, we, do, we, we do about 1,000 less pages. Um, some of this depends on the data type. I'm, you know, I'm finding different ways that, that it, oh, because I still, I'm doing the last two weeks. Sorry. So if I were doing, I should have done a query further back. So, so let's say time is uh, less than, shoot, we'll just do, we'll say a month ago. You'll see, so that was now a month of data we got. And because it went from compressed tables, it only had to read 600 pages of data. So most of that six, almost 7,000 pages was for the last two weeks that are not compressed. This is when you can get a much faster result, you know, at, at some value. So to get the average value for essentially four or five weeks happens in 94 milliseconds for me on this machine, and that's everything in between. Whereas if I do it for 
uh, greater than, and I'll just say the last, even the last two weeks. So this is some compressed data, some not compressed data. Um, it's a little bit slower now, not much because it's all in memory, uh, but it did a lot more work because it had to get all of those rows off a of disk uh, with all of the columns. So there's a lot to, to think about. I'd say the two biggest things that, that we have seen, uh, and I'm just going to do this real quick as an example. So let's just go back down to our one week. Uh, so this was one week. And we see that with one week chunks for these 200 devices, uh, we ended up with, what did I say? We ended up with a three percent, uh, a three x compression ratio, not three percent, almost seventy percent compression. So three three x. Um, if I were to take that same data, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this this one week thing. I'm going to go ahead and um, I'll go ahead and just drop it again. And so I'm setting up a new hyper table. So I know this might be a little bit jumping around here. So I have the same hyper table, same columns. Previously, I'm going to go way up to the top here. I have this query where I created that data. So previously, I had you know three decimal points on some of these. So I'm going to make some of these. You know, some people store Latin lawn with like millimeter precision. Uh, you know, temperature I'll make ten decimal points. I'll even give some decimal points to uh, distance um, five. So I'm going to insert that into my one week table. So same 3.5 million, this took about a minute. And then we're gonna compress it and see we were at three, but now I am getting a lot more precision in my data, so we have to track a lot more. So I see this often when people are storing uh, post-GIS information, right? So they're storing the Latin long values that are then used for post-GIS to six, seven, eight, nine decimal points which if you've ever seen that KXCD article, it's like every decimal point of GPS data, uh, you know, like at five or something, you're you're finding a freckle on my arm or I don't know, something mm -hmm. weird like that. It's, it's a funny article. Um, so these are the couple of things I think, you know, understanding both chunk size, how you uh, order the data. Uh, we can do a couple of things here in just a second to finish this uh, hour out. Like I said, it's, there's, it's so hard to demo this stuff and, have multiple versions and see uh, how things go. All right, we have 3.5 million rows. Uh, we're back down here with a one week. I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, boop, boop, boop. we're gonna go ahead and set up compression. We're gonna go ahead and compress everything but the most recent week, which is one or two chunks of data. And I didn't expect that, honestly. Um, now, it could be, again, my random nature of this data. Um, I expected the, well, so that's interesting. We had to store more data, right? Because we're storing more precision. Now I'm going to have to go. That's where the, the stream just fell apart. Um, generally, if I were to do one by integer incrementing, for instance, uh, it would it would be a much more performant compression. Um, I'm gonna have to look that one over and see see if I can make that a little bit better. And is it is it because of the like the algorithm, the compression algorithm? Um, it could be. Uh, it could also be that some of this got too big. So it's it's being stored in a different place in toast. Uh, there's there's a lot that can can affect what happens. I mean, we're still saving 70% on this. Um, and yeah, again, this still is the nature like, of the random yeah, data. <laughs> it's still a lot, right? I uh, still got many weeks more of, of run room on this. But um, data types matter, right? If I did a float four, for instance, as opposed to float eight, uh, you know, or double precision, uh, numeric would probably compress even worse because it's kind of infinitely, com you know, an infinite space that you can put data into. So a lot to play with. It's it's the idea though of knowing what happens. We had data, we set up compression. When we compress it, it now goes to this. Many rows are stored by column now. Much many fewer rows in the table that chunk. So if I compress data for that chunk, 
um, I now literally have to select fewer rows of data, fewer pages of data to get my result. So as you select more and more data, what normally would take, um, you know, a lot of work. And again, I'm, I'm not working with all of this data is currently fitting into memory on the server. So all of these queries are generally going to be pretty fast. The compressed values will still be faster on many of those aggregate queries um, at some level. But as I get more and more data, I get more and more um, benefit from that compressed aggregate and, and column store. So, uh, you know, this is like the third time I've tried to demo this. And every time I do, it's, it's really difficult without some other um, things. So this is going to be another reason for me to go back and, and rethink this with David uh, as we come next week. So if you end up uh, coming back next week, David's going to come on with me. We're going to actually dig in a little bit more. Uh, probably find a little bit better data set that that can actually show some of this more realistic than this random data. Um, you know, why you would choose segment by or multi-column segment by over uh, no segment by, or why you would choose ordering over not ordering data, um, particularly around queries. And so one of the things that, you know, we talked about, I'll finish with this. Um, let me come back to here uh, so you know we have a number of these uh, we've we've gotten a little bit in trouble on this I guess maybe but when we talked about for instance we we had clickhouse uh, we benchmark clickhouse one of the things that we talked about on here is that when you uh, compress data because we're getting um, that same benefit, of pulling off many values per row, not just one value per row, many values, a lot of queries in something like the benchmarking suite actually do improve. They actually get much faster. So before compression, doing a query like this, which might get you know hundreds of thousands of rows, uh, you know this is usually probably a one day or one week period. We might get hundreds of thousands of rows. And if I'm pulling row data, I have to get hundreds of thousands of rows. But if I pull compressed data, I get a few pieces of data, a few rows of data. All of the values I'm asking for are already in aggregate array form that I can run a quick uh, aggregation on. And so the query ends up being faster. Um, and this is not even about being faster in ClickHouse or being fast. This is just saying in TimescaleDB, you often get a faster query by compressing uh, if your query patterns uh, make sense. So that's what we're going to talk about next week. We're going to try and run through some data sets that show the value of that and what that looks like. I will, I've tried numerous times today to get this. Uh, I was going to try and show you the TSBS data set, and I just can't get it to run right now. So something on my end. Um, any other questions that come to mind? Uh, um... Yeah, I have one question that I actually I wanted to ask, um, which I don't know if there is like a perfect answer, but in in uh, I saw uh, a, well I just saw one user who had this uh, question um, uh, where they basically uh, try to compress their hyper table, and the compressed mm -hmm. uh, version ended up being uh, uh, larger than the original table, and. Uh, and uh, yeah. how how is that possible? Like I suppose that's uh, due to some misconfiguration. Uh, but yeah, how to solve that? Yeah, how to solve that? Um, I've seen that too. We more get that on. Um, sorry, we more get that on uh, continuous aggregates, right? A lot of people don't understand how we store things. So it's it's two reasons. One is. The data itself, um, I did not do a good job of, of showing what I thought it was going to show. Um, the data itself, sometimes uh, if, so often we see this in things like precision, uh, a numeric column, things of that nature that uh, doing compression on is actually really difficult because it, it can be infinitely, I say infinitely, it's not quite true, but the numeric data type in Postgres is a, um, kind of unbounded, I guess. Uh, so it can be data type issue uh, that, you know, the values that are stored there are, are really different in range and, and form. And so we're 
having to store a lot more information. Usually you're segmenting by too many columns. And so you went from something that has, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of rows per chunk and a data type that doesn't compress really well, and you're segmenting by many things. And so you're getting almost no benefit out of the compression. Um, and the overhead of it just ends up, now I don't know, did they have a value? Like how much it, it was bigger than? Do you remember? Um, okay I don't, I, I, I don't, uh, I don't remember. Great. Um, usually it's not going to be drastically like, you know, three times larger by, by any stretch, but usually it's because um, we're segmenting by so many things that you're not getting any value. Number one, you went from, you know, hundred thousand rows to 99,000 rows. And now it's the overhead of, um, you know, coming up with the individual columns and storing things out to toast, you know, all that does take effort. And if you're storing many, many, many really small files uh, in toast, you're not getting any real benefit out of it. It might actually take more space. So usually it's just a misconfiguration, trying to do something, you know, trying to use compressed chunks as if it's row data. And that paradigm is not, you know, if you always need a hundred thousand rows, all columns out of compressed chunks, if that is your querying pattern, this might not be the right feature for you, um, or you need to rethink how you're how you're doing it. Great, cool. All right, let's talk about um, as as we get more folks that that know we're doing these things. Hopefully, they can help guide some of the discussion. Uh, like I said, we're going to look at uh, compression, kind of a deep dive next week. Actual. You know, when I change setting X, here's how query responds. When I store this kind of data, maybe we'll go ahead and try and look at that one. You know, when can compressed data actually be more expensive than not compressed data? If that is possible. So that's a good thing to write down as a as a thing to look at. All right. As always, join Slack at timescale.com. It's in the bottom corner over there. Um, you know, that's where you find Attila, you find myself, other people from Timescale, a lot of great community uh, trying to, to help you out, figure out how to do this well. So thanks, awesome. sir. Have a good uh, evening. I know it's it's coming on evening for you. So thanks for joining me and asking yeah, great thanks, questions. Ryan. It was, it was, it you you helped me. You always help me learn more. It's good. Yeah. And tomorrow I will uh, do my stream and yeah. uh, I will uh, analyze NFT transactions with Postgres and Timescale DB. So awesome. if you're interested on Twitch and YouTube, uh, the NFT data is just really fun. It's really interesting. Yeah. You're having more and more fun looking at it. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's true. All right. Great. We, we should go and look at the compression of this and see, see how that NFT data is doing. Exactly. All right. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.